All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. And today I'm delighted to welcome back Phil Jones, who is actually, he's from the UK, but is actually in uh, New York today. How are you doing, Phil? I'm doing great, thanks, John. Thanks for having me back on the show. Yeah, and uh, Phil is the author of numerous books now, including this one here, Exactly What to Say. Great little book. I highly recommend it. I, I actually refer to this book on a regular basis because it's uh, it's got such gems in it. Uh, exactly What to Say, Exactly What to Sell, Exactly Where to Start, Straightforward to More Appointments. I could go on and on. You have a uh, whole... <laughs> right, so I suggest you uh, check out uh, Phil M. Jones on Amazon to see his complete collection. Um, so what we wanted to talk about today, Phil, is is just sales in general, because, OK, so we're heading into June and a lot of salespeople are on a calendar year. So they're kind of about halfway through their year now. So let's talk about what advice you would have for salespeople. Maybe you're behind in your your quota. Maybe you're getting a little stressed. It's halfway through the year. What are some of the things that you can start to do to um, set yourself up for a more successful second half of the year? Um, it's a great, great question, actually. And I'm just scribbling some notes down right now in front of me so we can, we can add some value to this properly. Um, and I think the most important thing is to start thinking about it right now. Mm-hmm. And, and not wait till November, December time to start thinking, oh, damn, I'm, you know, I'm down and I'm away from where I need to be for the year is now is the right time to start to be looking to be able to, to realign. And I think through my lens, there are three things that we can be doing at this point in time to really amplify second half success in any sales environment. The first is, is it's a great time to revisit No Not Todays. And No Not Todays, in my mind, is everybody over the last three years, they kind of nearly did some business with you. Mm-hmm. And we all know the ones, right? The ones that, you know, everything felt good, but the timing was off, or they had some other stuff that was happening internally within the organization that just never quite came over the finish line. Take the time to proactively go through the work you've already harvested and see what might be right for the picking today and just reach out and start some of those conversations. Easy way to start those conversations is with the truth. And it's a three-stage formula, which is a polite opening, followed by a mutually agreeable fact, followed by a question. So the polite opening is, you know, hi, it's Phil calling. That could be, hi, it's John calling from Sales Pop, right? There's the polite opening. Mm-hmm. Um, mutually agreeable fact that's so simple on this is, is I was thinking about you today. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Backed up another fact. We were speaking last February about the fact that you wanted to achieve blank, blank, and blank. Now we need a question on the end to engage the conversation. Question is, have you found a solution for that challenge yet? Right. So that's... Right? Yeah, so it's a very so the, it's a very simple but powerful formula, right? Because um, it's not it's not it's not from a from a buyer's point of view, it, as you say, it's polite, it's engaging, it's not it's not irritating or pushy. It's literally, as you say, uh, you know, you're saying hello, you're saying, listen, I was thinking about you. Did you find you know we talked last year? Did you find the solution you were looking for? That's it. And what we mustn't ever start those conversations with, which is the words that I hear so often, are the words I'm just following up. Like right. that's creepy. It's annoying. It shows <laughs> lack of professionalism. It's nonsense. Mm-hmm. So that's thing one is, is get after, you know, not today's. The second thing I'd get after is everybody who's your core existing happy account base, client base. And the question you need to be asking of them is, and what else? Mm-hmm. There is so much more business to be harvested in all of your existing happy customers, but too many sales professionals they don't think about the growth through their existing you know, core business. They don't think about the share of wallet they could be getting there. They don't think about the you know, expansion through other products and services they could be offering. They don't think about the growth opportunities there. So go back through your top 20, your top 50, your top 100, who it might be, and ask the question to yourself, first of all, and what else? Mm-hmm. When you've asked the and what else question, when you stumble across something that might have possibility, Lace with curiosity in the same way. Reach back out to those customers. Hi, it's Phil calling from, insert name of company. I was thinking of you today. I know that you're looking to achieve blank, doubled mutually agreeable fact, is, back up question, would you be open-minded to exploring possibilities with how we might be able to help you with blank? Mm-hmm. Boom. Yeah. Now we've prospected again in another avenue. Yeah, so, so Phil, why is it that a lot of people don't do that? Because I always find that, 
you know, when you suggest to to salespeople to go and you know look at existing accounts and all of that, they you know you often get the answer, oh no, I've I've done everything I can there, or there's no opportunity. It's almost like there's a reluctance to kind of rock the boat. There's yeah. a re- there's a reluctance to ask. Maybe you have a strong connection with one particular person there, or a couple of people there, and you don't want to sort of go beyond that, or you don't want to ask them to go beyond that. So, what what are some of the reasons that hold people back from doing that? Let's face the reality, right, is is most salespeople work harder to please their customers than they do to please their employer, mm-hmm. right? That, that That is a fact. And the result of which is that they don't necessarily want to, to lean in and rock the ball. Also, they're comfortable. They like to believe the fact that they, you know, they are awesome. That supports their mm-hmm. confidence. They'd like to think that they've never left any money on the table. If they realize that they leave some money on the table today, then they also validate the fact they left some money on the table mm-hmm. last week, last month, last year, last period, whatever. Mm-hmm. So actually, it's easier to be able to say, no, I got it all. Right. Not only that, is is with growth comes change, with change comes resistance. Like These are all normal factors, but it's easier to grow an existing customer than it is to sure. find a new one. Um, and we should be brave enough to be able to go and explore those possibilities. And, and, and asking the question, being fueled with curiosity, is really the objective here. So the mm-hmm. and what else question, I think, is, is something that we should be really getting some clarity towards. Absolutely. I've got a third thing they can do too, if you're interested. Yes, please. And, and the third thing is, is and who else? Mm. So the existing happy client bank of yours, if they say no to the and what else question, well, then they're saying, I've got everything I need from you. If they're saying, I've got everything they need from you, they must be happy with what they're getting from you. Chances are they know somebody like them in another organization that could well have the needs for the things that you have on offer. So use your existing customer base to be able to open a lukewarm door into somebody else you can start a conversation with. So so how is the best way to do that? Because I, I find that, again, uh, just like the and what else and the and who else, is a, a lot of salespeople, when you say to them, have you asked your existing customers about you know, referrals or opportunities, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I asked them. They, yeah, didn't, they, they didn't have any. Which is nonsense. Like the biggest difference between those that crush it and those that you know do just fine is those that crush it know exactly what to say, when to say it, how to make it count. Like you, you know that I'm pedantic about word choice. Sure. So it's how they ask for the referrals. If I say to somebody like, oh, oh, if, you know, have you got anybody else you can, you know, you could refer me to? They, yeah, yeah, I'll think about it. Yeah. Have you got anybody? Else? Well, yeah, probably. Like another time. Like they've asked the question, but they haven't created any internal motivation in the mm-hmm. other person to do anything with it. So we have to come at it in a different way. Now, if you use this formula of firstly going, no, not today's, then you do and what else, you're mm-hmm. going to hit in the and what else, I've got everything I need from you, mm-hmm. which is typically backed up with a simple set of words from somebody. The reason that people don't ask for referrals through my lens is for two reasons. Well, it could be three. One is um, they're too lazy, they can't be bothered. Mm-hmm. Now, they aren't the people that listen to podcast shows like this, so we sure. probably don't need to worry about it. <laughs> Must be one of the other two reasons. It could be the fact that they don't know when to ask. Mm -hmm. There's a timing issue. It's like, where do I precisely fit this into conversation? And if it's not when, it's how. It's Mm -hmm. skill-based. It's, you know, how specifically should I word this or phrase this to be able to get these words out of my mouth so I don't sound pushy or needy because I want to carry the posture that I have normally Mm -hmm. come to to, to, to garner in these environments. So let's deal with the when and the how chances are we're probably going to be able to empower some people to ask more frequently. The when could be dozens of occasions, but all of those occasions fall into one precise set of circumstances of how the other person is feeling. Mm -hmm. The other person is feeling content or better still happy with what you've done for them. Right. If people are happy with what they've done for you, they typically reach for a set of words. The set of words they reach for are the words, thank you. Mm -hmm. When they say thank you, you have to understand what they really mean in their psychology. When somebody mouths the words thank you to you, what you shouldn't be doing is patting yourself on the back (laughs) thinking you're a hero. When they say thank you, understand the reason that somebody mouths the words thank you is they were coming from a position of feeling indebted. That's why we say thanks. A thank you is a repayment of a debt. I say thank you. We're back to even. Mm -hmm. Best time to ask somebody to do something more for you or introduce you to somebody new is at the point when they feel indebted. Why? Because that's when their obligation is at its highest point to be able Mm -hmm. to act on your behalf. So what do we do? When they are feeling indebted, we now need to say, well, they say thank you. Here's my cue to go. What we do is we ask a question that's really easy to say that yes to. In fact, let's test it right now. This is a sequence of magic words that you can use to get somebody to agree to take an action before they even know what the action is. And to help with this, John, would you do me a small favor? Sure. There's the words. 
Why is it when I request somebody to do a favor, I get a unanimous yes in the other direction without them even knowing what it is? Because, so, you know, because we're, we're in a nice conversation, I'm feeling good, you're, you're doing something for me right now, you're coming on my show, as you said, I right. feel in debt, of course I'm going to do you a favor. The same as what would happen if you were a prospect customer scenario or a customer and salesperson scenario is if you ask at the right time after they've just said thank you, would you do me a small favor, you're going to get a guaranteed yes in the other direction. Now we follow it up with the next sequence of words. We might say something like you wouldn't happen to know. If I use the wouldn't happen to know as opposed to do you know, then what I do is I throw down a challenge. Not only do I throw down a challenge, but what I also do is I suggest they probably don't know somebody. If I suggest they probably don't know somebody, I create an internal motivation in them that they're likely to know somebody. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person. Why would I ask for just one person as opposed to anybody or somebody? Is Well, it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Not only is it reasonable, it focuses the mind. It narrows Mm -hmm. in the fact that this is a focus. Now, we're going to further apply a focus to that. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person, somebody who just like you. Right. The just like you is a further filter. Not only that, it's a compliment. It says, I like you. I want more people like you. I think you're awesome. Mm -hmm. Here's the only part of this formula that would change. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person, somebody who just like you would benefit from. Right. Let's take Pipeline and CRM, for example. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person, somebody who just like you, that would benefit from having all of their contacts in one place, Mm -hmm. have intelligent information about them, and get constant reminders about how they can impact meaningful conversations with their customers, would you? Zip it. Yeah. Right? Now what you've done is you've created an obligation on them to lean forward. They say, yeah, I could probably think of a few people. Mm -hmm. Now I might say, well, look, don't worry. I'm not looking for their details right now. But who was it you were thinking of? Now I get a name. Yes. Now what most salespeople will do right now is they'll take the name and they'll run with it and have this <laughs> clunky conversation. with. Like, I spoke to John. He gave me a name and <laughs> details. Said you might be interested in blank. And now you're a pushy person. Right, right. Change it up. I might now say, if I got introduced to John, I might say, well, when are you next speaking to John? Mm-hmm. Exactly. They say, well, you know, I might be likely to see him maybe maybe next week. You say, well, when you see him next week, would you do me a further favor? Other person says, yes. I say, when you next see John, will you tell him a little about your experience of doing business with me? See if he's perhaps open-minded to taking mm-hmm. a phone call from me to see if we can help him in the same way we've helped you. He says, well, yeah, sure. You say, what day are you likely to have that done by? He says, maybe by Thursday. You say, would it be okay if I drop your call on Friday? Find out how it goes. They say, sure. You say, morning or afternoon. They say, when's good for you, right? But we lock this thing in, and guess what happens? We now have a conversation 10 days down the track that starts with, I'm guessing you didn't get around to speaking to John. Right. Uh, To which they say, yes, I did, because they're people of their word, or they say, oh, no, I didn't. I forgot. Let me fix it for you right now. Mm -hmm. The irony is if you slow the process down, you speed the outcome up, you end up having meaningful conversations where the credibility, which is what you need to get through those doors, is already been sewn for you by your existing happy customer. That changes the dynamic. Yeah, I love what I love about that, Phil, is that's such a deliberate process. It's a thoughtful process, uh, and I think that's and I think that's exactly what's missing from a lot of salespeople is that they is that they understand. Okay, they understand that referrals are fantastic, but as you say, they don't have a process for going after them in in a, in a systematic or meaningful way. And I think what you just outlined there is is fantastic because it is it is really at the end of the day engaging your customer in a kind of partnership together because yeah. and and let's face it we we love we love to refer things that that we have a good experience or we love being experts and, and and the worst thing that happens though is is when people have a referral program that has a financial incentive in it mm-hmm. Because what then starts to happen is they say, well, if you refer me to somebody, you know, like, like I'll give you 250 quid or 500 quid bucks or whatever the number might be. Um, and this cheapens everything that people do. Because particularly for your existing happy customer base, mm-hmm. what you've just projected to them is there's enough margin in this sure. for me to be able to give money away. Mm-hmm. So you've prompted a fee negotiation. Mm-hmm. Not only that is you've asked, you've asked somebody you love trust in the door to do something for you for a bribe, (laughs) which changes the trust and the dynamic of the relationship. You're asking for the referral based on the quality of the work that you've done, not based on the promise of the bribe. Mm -hmm. If you, though, want to encourage a behavior of referrals, instead of bribing the consumer to be able to do it for you, take the exact same money that you had allocated towards the bribe and use that to say thank you after they've done it. 
and present them with a gift that shows a token of your gratitude yeah. towards the activity. Now you train the behavior that they say, how do I get people to say thank you again? So the psychology around that is quite important to understand too. Yeah, I, I had an experience a number of years ago actually with a, <clears throat> with a mortgage broker way back in the day here who, um, who I was referred to through my accountant, right? And, and the first thing the mortgage broker did, one of the first things he did after that was he, he pulled out this, was like a huge org chart. And he showed me all of the different referrals that had come through all of his people. And he said, oh, here, so you came through David. So that's right. Now I have to send David something and really thank him and all. And it was just really impressive because you just had this whole ecosystem of people. And from my point of view, it was just so impressive that he he had built a whole business on on exactly kind of what you're saying. That's it. It's that simple. But like if a salesperson executes those three things right now through the month of June, July mm -hmm. and August, they won't be worrying about quota at the end of the year. And yeah. it doesn't need to be any more than that. It's just execute those three things to a high standard consistently. They'd be probably looking at the best year they've ever had. Yeah, so that's great. So let's recap for everybody. Okay, so it's the no, not today. So go back to the people uh, who you may have talked to in the past who weren't ready for you at the time. Uh, uh, then to the existing clients, the what else, and then also to your existing customer base, the who else. But do it, as you say, like, listen again, or rewind, listen again to exactly what Phil said and the way it was done. Because as you say, um, you know, Phil is all about words and the, the elegant way he puts it together. I mean, who could refuse you? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. I'm still wondering on that one. Maybe my wife sometimes. <laughs> I love it. All right, Phil, well, we're bumping up against the end of our time here. But before we go, just love to uh, you to tell everyone a little more about yourself, what you're up to these days, how they can learn more about you. You bet. Yeah, I, I mean, I spend the bulk of my time serving communities like the ones that you have here, um, helping them to be able to have more effective conversations, to be able to convert more of them, to make more of them count. That, that's my business. So I travel the world giving keynote presentations, large format workshops, writing for some of the world's top publications. Um, and jumping on interviews like this one here. That's pretty much what I do right now, as well as running four or five other businesses. And if people want to find out more about me, philmjones.com is a great place to be able to dive in. If you want to learn more about the content we've jumped into today, I think the two resources that will probably serve you best, one is the simple read of exactly what to say, which you jumped into earlier. Yep. And the second is I just recorded a new program with Audible which was following my goal of creating the most accessible sales training program that exists for anybody on the planet, which is called How to Persuade and Get Paid. And that's a uh, in-your-ear live workshop experience that you can access on audible.com and only on Audible, recorded as an Audible original. Wow, so, um, fantastic. Yeah, and as I said, I highly recommend this book. You could read this book uh probably in about, I don't know, like 20 minutes, maybe if you're a fast reader, but you can come back to it time after time and get your words right and the success will come with it. Listen, Phil, this has been fantastic. Thanks again for making time for us. My, my pleasure. Is, my pleasure. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.